Every day, more and more people are making movies. Filmmaking has become the new garage band. I'm Johnny DiLoretto, and this is Frame Lines, the series that aims the lens on those who are out there making movies. Some are backyard Kubricks, making movies for fun, and others are aspiring Spielbergs, professionals working hard to make it in the industry. Framelines is happy to present a special presentation of the best of our tech tips, so stay tuned for some filmmaking hints and tricks. For many people starting out making movies, just photographing the scene they wrote is enough, shooting it from one angle like this. Here we have a simple scene where a man and a woman are meeting at a restaurant. Hey. Sorry I'm late. Okay. So, what's good here? Listen, we need to talk. You can even add coverage from a few angles to make it more visually interesting like this. We need to talk. Well, what is it? I know you cheated. Using the camera to help tell the story means that just as the actors have to change their performance to match the dialogue, the camera needs to change as well. And at the moment she tells him she knows he cheated on her, the cameras have to reflect the change in the relationship. We can change the height of the cameras so that we are looking down at him and up at her. This alone changes the tone of the scene. We can also change the angle so there's an awkward negative space, even showing the door in the frame, subconsciously showing that he wants to leave. You can also add camera movement to make the whole scene move along to the emotions of the scene. Hey, sorry I'm late. That's okay. <sighs> What's good here? Listen, we need to talk. What is it? I know you cheated on me. Our specials today are the crab stuffed filet mint seared wrap. We're gonna of need lamb. a minute. <sighs> Notice the dolly shot. The camera movement in insinuates the man's guilt. Directing isn't just yelling action and cut. You have to use the camera to help tell the story. When you make your shot list, think about how to make the camera a part of the scene. Last night you watched a movie and you think you can do better. Well, what do you need? You're going to need a camera, first off. What, what does a camera cost? Well, I think Basically, you're going to spend somewhere between $300 to $5,000 and up to get a camera that is good for filmmaking. So where do you find a camera? Well, you can try the big box stores. Uh, they, they have a, a kind of limited selection, but uh, you can do okay there. Uh, you can go mail order through the internet, but be very careful how you buy. Check out that seller before you go and buy that. There are many ways you can get ripped off. You can get a gray market camera, which was intended for another country. It has no warranty. They can try to add all kinds of accessories at a high rate, like charge you twice what it would cost to get a battery. There's a great site out there called Reseller Rating, which you can look at online sellers and it'll get a true rating of those. So what do you need in a camera? Well, I mean, you need a good working camera, number one. But some of the features that I think are a must, you need an external mic jack uh, because the microphones on cameras are pretty good if you're gonna pick up audio from less than three feet. But if you need good audio and you got several actors on the scene, you're gonna have to hook in an external mic like a shotgun mic. So you must have an external mic jack. And that could be a mini plug or a full XLR, but usually cameras that have XLRs on them are more expensive. The next thing you're gonna need is manual exposure. This way you can control the image. Uh, if you don't have that, and let's say you have somebody standing in front of a window talking, you're gonna end up with a silhouette. They're gonna be this black shape and nobody's gonna know who they are. So you need manual exposure. The next thing you should have is manual white balance. Now this is not essential for beginning filmmakers, but if you really want to control your image, you need to be able to control the white balance. The next factor you have to deal with is sensor size. Currently, DSLRs, digital single lens reflex cameras that shoot video are very hot because they have the large sensor and they give you a very filmic feel. 
The problem is the ergonomics of them don't make them good video cameras. It's hard to change exposure on the fly or run audio levels while recording audio. Where a standard video camera will may have smaller sensors and give you more depth of field, but you can control the aperture, you can control the audio levels a lot easier when using them. So for a run and gun type filmmaking, you might be better to get a standard video camera. Although now some video cameras are coming out with the larger sensor, so you get the best of both worlds. You have the large sensor and you can still control many of the aspects of the image and the audio. Well, all right, now you've got your camera, you're gonna need some accessories. And probably the first one you're gonna really need is a case for your camera. You can't show up to set bringing the camera in a paper bag or a, a, a little cardboard box. Uh, a decent case can start at $20 and go up to a couple hundred dollars. Now we found this cool little tool case you can get at a hardware store that's great for smaller cameras and it can fit accessories, it has padding in it, it costs around $25. The next thing you're gonna need is a tripod. Uh, a lot of beginning filmmakers, they don't use a tripod and it gives a very amateur look to their films. Get a tripod and get the camera steady so you can get good shots. Tripods cost as little as $40 and up to hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Don't go to the big box store and buy the $40 tripod. I've seen those, they break very easily. They're not very workable. I believe you can between $100 and $150, you can get a workable tripod for a beginning filmmaker. The final thing is also you're gonna need batteries, spare batteries. All cameras usually come with one very small battery, which will run your camera for half an hour to 40 minutes and then you're done. So go get on eBay or wherever and look and get a, a spare battery. I recommend two and get the larger batteries that can run your camera for you know, two to three hours. One other option instead of buying a camera is renting a camera because maybe you can afford a certain level of camera, but you're buying a mediocre camera where if you rent, you can get a very high end camera with great images and great features. One thing I tell filmmakers is instead of buying a camera, buy the things that go with it like lenses or light kits or microphones because those are format agnostic it doesn't matter what camera you're shooting with, you can use them with that. So you can constantly use the most current camera by renting, but all these other things will work for you for the next 10 years. Finally, take your time when buying a camera. Do your research. What kind of camera do you need for your type of filmmaking? Research the cameras, research the people you're buying from, and pick the camera that fits your needs. Ever see those names at the end credits of a movie and wondered what those people actually do? Elizabeth McPherson tells us in this clip. The Director of Photography, also known as the DP or DOP. The DP is someone who is responsible for the process of photographing a scene in the manner desired by the director. The Director of Photography has a number of possible duties selection of film stock, cameras and lenses, designing and selecting lighting, directing the gaffer's placement of lighting, shot composition in consultation with the director, film developing and film printing. On larger shoots, the DP often does not even touch the camera and that job is done by a camera operator. The difference between a cinematographer and a director of photography depends on the situation. The most common distinction is that a cinematographer is a director of photography that operates his own camera, but that isn't always true. Did you know that Thomas Edison had the patent on motion pictures? For a time, the Thomas Edison Corporation owned the patent on all motion pictures in the United States, based on his device, the kinetoscope. The kinetoscope began a standard where strips of film with holes were put in front of a light all in a row, creating the illusion of movement. Edison said he wanted to do for moving pictures what the phonograph did for audio.
create the shot palette for production and eventually editing, there's several types of shots you can start with. For a scene, you can start with an establishing shot. This is usually an exterior to show the audience where the scene is going to take place. Next, you can show a master shot. This shows the geography of a scene, the proximity of the actors to one another, and the objects in a scene. Now you can get into the coverage for a scene. Over the shoulder shots are commonly used to keep that sense of geography in a scene, even though it's a new camera angle. Cutting to another over the shoulder shot keeps the editorial pace going, but also shows the other actors reacting, listening, and delivering their lines. From there, you can go to the close-ups. These usually follow the over the shoulder shots and continue the spatial relations. Extreme close-ups are when you want to get much closer in on an actor's face or anything else you want to get a lot more detail on in the shot. For a more effective use of these shot types, it's better to save the close-ups and extreme close-ups for moments that are more revealing, more important to the characters and the scene. That way they can have a bigger impact on the audience. Scott Spears gives us a few camera tips in this next segment. In this tip, we're gonna talk about lighting units. And these are the lights that you bring to set to light your subjects. Uh, they can range from anything from this style LED light to tungsten style light to a uh, fluorescent style light that's lighting me right now. Let's break down the units. Here's your basic 1K open face light. It's not focusable. It's again, a 1K, which means 1000 watts. And one thing I wanna talk about is if you need to replace a light in one of these uh, units, don't touch the bulb with your fingers. The oils from your fingers will be like a frying pan oil. It'll cause the bulb to explode. So always wear some gloves or hold a piece of plastic or et cetera. Here's your basic 600 watt open face light. It has a focusable beam. You can tighten it or widen the beam by using the knob. Uh, it comes with a set of barn doors that you can close down to make a nice slash or a pattern on your wall. And you can also attach gels to this. Here's another open face light. This is a 1K and it's focusable um, and it comes with a set of barn doors. Uh, the one thing different about this light, it has a safety screen in it. So if the lamp would explode, the uh, bulb fragments won't fly out and burn your talent up. They don't like that. It's not fun for them. Here's a Fresnel light. And what makes a Fresnel special, it just has a lens in it. And what this lens does, it, it gives you a more even spread to your light. Where open face lights can have spots, hot spots to them. This is going to be even almost edge to edge. This Fresnel also has a focusing knob that allows you to move the light back and forth so you can get a wider or tighter beam out of it. One thing we need to talk about is color balance in lights. This is a tungsten light. It's 3200 degrees Kelvin, which is just a way of saying the wavelengths of light are a certain wavelength, but it's a warm light compared to daylight, which is a cool light, which is 5600 degrees Kelvin. Here we've got an LED light, and this is the hot new light for film sets. There are a series of LEDs that are very low power and can be run off a of battery. You'll notice that this LED light is daylight balanced right now. You can simply add a gel to balance it for your tungsten light. This is a fluorescent style light. Uh, they're very popular because they're low power and low heat. And this is a two bank, but they can come in four banks. They can come in six banks. These are only two feet. Uh, lamps, but they can come in four feet or bigger. Here we've got a soft bank, and this is actually a cover that goes over top of a light and has a hunk of cloth diffusion in it. And it's just a really good light for shooting interviews or some general set lighting, but it's very popular for soft lighting. This covers the basic light units you're gonna find in your set. There are other variations on these, but these are the basics. So we hope you enjoyed this tip. We hope you come back to Frame Lines for more. Assistant camera, aka assistant camera operator, first assistant cameraman, and camera assistant. The assistant cameraman is a member of the camera crew who assists the camera operator. This person is responsible for the maintenance and care of the camera, placing it where the DP wants in between shots, etc. In smaller camera crews, they may also perform the duties of clapper loader and or a focus puller. The clapper loader is a crew member who loads film or tape into the camera. On film, this person loads film negative into the magazines and unloads exposed film for processing. 
On a video shoot, this is now for loading and unloading tapes or dealing with copying footage from hard drives or data cards like P2 or Compact Flash or SD. They are also responsible for slating with the clapper. The focus puller is the person in the camera department that adjusts the focal length on the lens during a shoot for the camera operator. This job often entails making sure the focus plane is correct when shifting focus from one subject to another. Like all departments on set, the smaller the shoot, many of these jobs get combined into fewer people. Oftentimes, a DP is his own focus puller or an assistant cameraman loads and slates, etc. Next up, Peter John Rosh shares some insight about making movies. One of the first things we need to cover in making any movie is orienting the viewer. The first rule we can look at is the 180 degree rule. Once you establish a scene and show where people are, you've also established the 180 degree rule. From this master shot, we've established that the woman is on the right and the man is on the left. That means that whenever we show them, he should be on the left and she should be on the right side. From the overhead, we can show that as soon as we place them for the camera, the placement of the camera can only go anywhere on this side of the line, meaning 180 degrees on this line. We can aim the camera in any direction, but it must be on this side of the line. Now even though from overhead we can clearly see where the actors are, it's not as clear from what the camera sees. If we break the 180 degree rule and place one camera here and the other camera over here, the camera view shows the actors facing the same direction. Even when the angles are not as blatantly off, it can be disorienting because the actors' eye lines won't match. Now, you can cross the 180 degree line, but you have to show the camera move, like so. Not only do you have to shoot this movement of crossing the line, but you also have to use it in the edit. That way you orient the viewer. Once you're on the other side of the line, you have to stay on it, unless you move the camera back to the other side. Remember, the camera is the viewer in the scene. They're a non-active participant in everything that's going on. They only see what you show them. Hi, I'm Scott Spears, and here I am with a film tech tip. Today we're going to talk about what's in your camera bag, and, and because when you go out in the field, you're going to need all kinds of little goodies to help you in, in your shoot, and so what do you carry with you? And I guess the first thing we want to talk about is you're going to need a bag for your camera, some way to carry it. And, and down below we've got some camera bags here. Also you can end up with a hard case. If you travel a lot by plane, you probably want a hard case because a soft bag won't protect your camera well enough. Uh, and they can vary in sizes. They can be soft cases, they can be soft cases with lots of padding. One case we ran into is just a a little $20 tool kit that is great for putting your camera in. You want a case that is large enough to hold the camera plus accessories, but not so large that the camera floats around in it, otherwise it can get banged up and you can break switches or, or ding up your camera. So that's an important thing. You want to make sure the camera fits well in your case. So what's the number two? What's the other thing you want in your camera case? Well, you better put some tape stock in there. And depending on how long your shoot is for the day, if I'm just going out to shoot an interview, I make sure I have at least three tapes. If it's an all-day shoot on a drama or something like that, I'll carry 10 tapes. What else do you need? Spare batteries. A lot of people buy cameras, they go, oh, I'll just use the onboard. Well, what happens when it dies? So you want to have at least two spare batteries. I mean, so really three batteries total. And you want to buy the big batteries. And yes, it's painful to spend 70, 80 bucks or 100 bucks on batteries, but do it because your shoot's done if your camera runs out of power. Oh, and another thing you'll need for your batteries is carry a charger with you, because if you're out in the field and you use up all your batteries, you can, you can be charging one while you're shooting. What's something else you might want to carry is a head cleaning cassette. And this is if you clog the heads on your camera, you can run this through there. What else? You need a pair of headphones. So we've got headphones here. And I buy full ear headphones. Some people do the earbud thing. I'm not big into earbuds because sound leaks in. Okay, another thing you carry with you is I just, again, another Ziploc bag with some connectors in it. And these are three 
connectors you should go nowhere without. This is a uh, BNC to RCA, so if you need to plug in a professional monitor, which is an RCA cable, a barrel, which converts BNC to RCA, or just a barrel connector that allows you to connect two BNCs together. I always also carry a couple C47 media attachment clips, so if you need to hook a gel on something, you've got one, so if you need one, or just hook a script to something. Carry a ground lifter or an Edison adapter, so if you need to adapt this down to uh, something down to a two-plugger. One thing you might want to carry with you is just a small mirror so the talent can check their makeup, so it's a handy little thing to have. This isn't the kind of optional thing, a insert slate. Another thing I always carry with me is a notepad and a pen, so I can take notes if I need to. If I need to remember the cameras at five feet, you know, blah, 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 for some effect later, got notes, so you want this. Also, the pen is good for uh, labeling your tapes later. Another thing I carry is the manual, and I put it inside a nice plastic bag to protect it. On the audio side, another thing I carry is two, a spare audio cable. One thing you might want to put in your kit is some kind of multi-tool. It's a good little handy thing to have. I have a little micro Leatherman I carry everywhere, but this is a good thing to have in your kit. Here's something I stumbled across, is a little small roll of one, uh, one inch gaff tape. Another thing I carry is just another cheap pair of headphones or earbuds. So if my headphones fail, the cord breaks or the adapter breaks or something, I carry a spare set. All right, now we're gonna talk about uh, uh, lens cleaning. I carry with me a little Ziploc bag and I've got some lens cleaning fluid and lens cleaning tissue. Here's another thing I carry. This is just a little lens puffer. So it's just a little, and it's got a little horsehair brush on it. You just need to brush some dust off the lens. It's a handy thing to have. Also, you should carry some business cards with you because you never know who's gonna see you shooting and might want you to shoot something for them. And one final thing I like to carry with me is some kind of food. I carry like granola bars or cheese and crackers or something. Uh, not a big hunk of chocolate bar because it'll melt in your kit and make a big mess. So something that's super, not super perishable. So there are lots of other things you can carry in your kit and you might come up with some things. If you want to, email them to me. The Grip and Electric Department are a group of people who work toward the look of the film. They work with the director of photography and the cinematographer to create the mood of the lighting. A grip is responsible for the setup, adjustment, and maintenance of the production equipment on the set. Their typical duties involve camera movement, lighting, refinement, and mechanical rigging. The key grip works closely with the director of photography and the gaffer to sculpt the desired look of the film by diffusing and shaping the light. The key grip is also in charge of camera movement, whether on a dolly, camera crane, or mounted on the hood or bumper of a vehicle. A dolly grip is a grip that moves a dolly. The gaffer, also known as the chief lighting technician, is the head of the grip and electric department responsible for the lighting and the planning of the shoot. In the early 20th century, most movies used natural light, which they covered up with the large cloths using poles called gaffs. Depending on the size of your movie, the budget, and the number of people that you have to work with, the G&A jobs often get combined. Let's go to a short take. August and Louis Lumiere were photographers in France that saw Thomas Edison's kinetoscope in Paris in 1894, and they innovated on that idea. The kinetoscope could only show a movie to one person at a time. The Lumiere brothers created the Cinematograph, which could project the moving images on a large screen for a group of people. What the Lumiere brothers did in 1895 is basically the exact same experience that every single cinema has today. Even just a few years ago, the idea of editing meant just cutting from one shot to another, and the most special effect was a dissolve. Today, the editor's job expands into all kinds of effects and also fixes. There's a common saying that most people want to avoid, and it's, we'll fix it in post. Meaning, during post-production, you try to fix mistakes from the shoot. Things have changed a lot recently. 
What used to be a ruined take can now be easily fixed in editing. Here we have two shots where the boom mic entered the frame or the shadow of the crew was seen. I never talked to him and he asked you about that and did your social contract and now you're in the clear, right? In the old days, that meant you either had to reshoot or choose a different take. Today we have options. You can take a part of the frame from either before or after the mistake, then crop it down to just the area you need to cover it up. Then lay it on top of the take you want to use. Voila! You have a seamless fix on that take that might otherwise have been perfect. Thinking a little outside of the box, using the digital technology in ways that maybe you hadn't considered, means you can do more with your footage. Cinema Verite started as a form of documentary filmmaking with the use of handheld cameras for a you are there feel to the cinematography. Since its beginnings in the 1960s documentaries, films like Saving Private Ryan adopted the style in the narrative film. The entire subgenre of found footage films can be considered cinema verite. If you'd like more information on the filmmakers or to purchase a DVD of tonight's program, please visit www.framelines.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook. That's a wrap. We'll catch you next time on Framelines.